Thank you, Gemma. Uh, don't want to disappoint Gemma, but I will uh, focus only on uh, one single topic because I think it's better for you to, to deepen your understanding on something rather than to have uh, something too broad. So I will touch uh, upon the oldest antithrombotic drug that exists and I will show you how much we still need to understand about aspirin and how aspirin works and what we should do. And uh, I'm pleased to be here because this is um, very familiar to me. I've been, uh, uh, this is the heart, European heart house, but could also be my house for a long, long time. And uh, in this room, actually, we held uh, the most uh, long-standing course of the European Society of Cardiology, which was, was dedicated for over 10 times to antithrombotic drugs. So these are my conflicts. And... Uh, I will uh, talk about uh, the ups and downs of aspirin as an antithrombotic agent, specifically in the setting of uh, primary cardiovascular prevention. And I will uh, dwell also on some basic concepts that are related to this. But just to engage you, to, to let you understand how this may touch each of you, this is the clinical scenario in which I want to bring you. Your mother, the dearest persons that you have, 65 years old, active lady with hypertension, impaired glucose tolerance, slightly overweight. At a routine carotid ultrasound, the cardiologist has found a carotid artery plaque, 40% in diameter, so it's non-hemodynamically significant, so nothing to intervene mechanically on this plaque. This level does not merit an interventional thought, would you like her to be on aspirin or not? And this question is currently totally unresolved. And I will tell you that there has been an extremely prolific thought of uh, articles. And just uh, to let you understand, the New England Journal of Medicine is probably for clinical cardiologists, for clinicians, is the most respected journals in, journal in the world. Most of you probably would say that Cell is the most ambitious journal where to publish, but for, you will agree that the New England is also a quite acceptable journal. And uh, only in 2018, there were uh, six papers that appeared in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine dwelling on the issue of primary prevention of aspirin. So... But let's uh, go back a little bit uh, to the origin of the story of actually thrombosis and myocardial infarction, which is something that uh, is very close to uh, what uh, Professor Tenkate has shown you. Before 1980, the origin of myocardial infarction was not clear at all because uh, there were uh, pathologists and cardiologists that were divided into two schools of thought. Is thrombus the cause or the consequence, the chicken or the egg? Is thrombosis the cause or the consequence? The consequence because uh, you may have uh, pathological reports that date from those years that show that uh, you have uh, a frequency of thrombosis in acute myocardial infarction in the order of 40 to 50 percent. So those who were arguing against coronary thrombosis were saying, but you see, 50% of myocardial infarctions do not have a thrombus detected by pathology. So how can you claim that thrombosis is the cause of myocardial inf infarction? And at one point, uh, this dispute was largely resolved because of one single paper that appeared uh, again in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1980 by these uh, investigators from uh, Los Angeles, Marcus De Wood and co-workers, who assessed the prevalence of uh, total coronary occlusion in the early hours of uh, an acute myocardial infarction. Just to let you understand, at that time, coronary angiography was prohibited in uh, acute coronary syndromes, was considered a taboo. You should never touch a patient with a, an acute myocardial infarction. But actually, you know that now coronary angiography is the beginning of the treatment of uh, acute myocardial infarction for uh, most cases in most uh, places in the world. And so these investigators attempted to do coronary angiography in the early hours 
of an acute myocardial infarction, and they found something that explained the variability of the pathological findings in uh, myocardial infarction. If you run a coronary angiography in the early hours, then you see in less than uh, four hours, you have uh, almost 90% of uh, those myocardial infarctions that were seen at that time that had a total coronary occlusion. If you move out from the acute phase, then the percentage goes down. And this can be explained by the so-called spontaneous thrombolysis or spontaneous fibrinolysis that takes place, by which the thrombus forms and then, in some cases, dissolves spontaneously. So if you have the opportunity of uh, making a snapshot of the situation in the early hours, you find it. This will cause the death of the cardiomyocytes it caused the consequences and sometimes the death of the patient. But if, you, if the patient survives and you have this snapshot at later times, you don't see this occlusion any longer. Still, the occlusion was present before and was the cause. This is closely linked to the uh, history of aspirin. Aspirin is uh, the oldest drug in uh, the antithrombotic armamentarium and actually is probably the oldest uh, active drug that we still use. Aspirin is only 121 years old actually because it was discovered in 1897 and I will go back a little bit to this uh, interesting discovery. But uh, we like to, to write uh, on this uh, topic a kind of a historical paper. Jeremy knows because uh, he approved for publication at one point. Because the origin of, uh, uh, of aspirin is actually older because aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid and uh, the old uh, remedies in uh, classical medicine include salicylates and actually in uh, the Ebers papyrus in ancient Egypt there is already a mention of the use of uh, willow leaves to relieve pain. So willow leaves in uh, Latin is salix, and so it's uh, the origin of the use of an active substance contained in willow leaves that later on was uh, salicylate. But uh, uh, the story of uh, aspirin myocardial infarction also uh, is uh, largely due to a uh, British investigator. We acknowledge this clearly because in 1974 there was the first attempt of uh, making a randomized controlled trial of aspirin in myocardial infarction due to the epidemiologists uh, working in, uh, in uh, uh, Cardiff, uh, Peter Elwood. But it took many years to understand that this was really a clear effect and another important reason why the history of aspirin is linked to the history of all cardiology and all cardiovascular medicine is that uh, the first meta-analysis in uh, cardiovascular history is uh, related to aspirin trials. And this is due to uh, Richard Pato, the uh, great epidemiologist uh, working in Oxford. Richard Peto uh, had uh, the idea of combining data from uh, multiple inconclusive trials into one single aggregate result. And this was really the origin of uh, meta-analysis that uh, appeared for the first time in uh, The Lancet in 1980. And now you know that this is a widely accepted technique uh, to make sense of the heterogeneity of the trials. This was also uh, quite much linked to my own uh, personal history because in uh, those years I was working on uh, the uh, issue of whether you should use uh, high or low doses of aspirin. And uh, in those years we proved that in patients with myocardial infarction in a series of papers you could uh, inhibit the biochemical mechanism by which aspirin is thought to work, which is uh, inhibiting platelet thromboxane formation. And, uh, inhibit also the consequences of this process on platelets, platelet aggregation, by using a tiny little amount of aspirin. And actually we showed that even 50 milligram per day were enough to inhibit uh, thromboxin production almost maximally to 96, 97, 98 percent. And this is uh, uh, a very powerful way of assessing the effect of a drug that translates uh, then uh, later on in uh, inhibition of platelet aggregation. <laughs>
So to go back uh, to the methods, uh, I say that uh, the birthday of aspirin is uh, 1987, is uh, um, attributed generally to Felix Hoffman, who was uh, a chemist working in uh, Bayer at the time. Bayer was at the time a dye company, mostly a chemical company, but at one point uh, there was uh, uh, a chemist, Eichengrun, that decided to start uh, a, a pharmacological uh, section of, uh, of Bayer, and under his guidance, uh, this gentleman, Felix Hoffman, reported in his uh, uh, notebook, very important thing, to write things, what people, does, what people do every day in, uh, in a notebook, wrote that uh, if you heat uh, uh, salicylic acid with acetic anhydride for three hours, you can come up with a compound which is uh, more stable than salicylic acid and has uh, actually new properties compared to, sal to salicylate. Because uh, the way that uh, acetyl salicylic acid uh, works is actually different from, as from salicylic acid. It, uh, it is the acetyl moiety that does most of the trick. By inhibiting one protein, uh, cyclooxygenase 1, which is uh, not regenerated by platelets other than when platelets are produced from the bone marrow because platelets have a very limited capacity to regenerate proteins because they lack the nucleus. And so the irreversible acetylation of uh, COX-1 in platelets makes platelets permanently marked with this uh, inhibition. And this translates later on in uh, the inhibition of the conversion of arachidonic acid into prostaglandin GH, which is eventually converted to thromboxin A2 uh, within platelets. So the inhibition of this single step that then translates into biochemical and uh, functional effects, uh, ultimately, as I will show you, leading also to protection from thrombosis. And uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, this was studied uh, at uh, that time through um, the technique that was developed by Gustav Born at that time at uh, University College London. He uh, developed this uh, uh, system by which if you take uh, a suspension of platelets, the so-called uh, platelet-rich plasma that you can uh, uh, make it very easily by using uh, citrated uh, cited uh, plasma in uh, spinning down uh, the red blood cells so you end up uh, with a concentration of a suspension of uh, platelets in plasma and then you add uh, an aggregating agent the prototype of which ADP and then you measure the amount of light transmission or light transmittance through the suspension of platelets and when platelets aggregate form uh, aggregates lights passes quickly through the suspension and you can measure the signal and you have uh, the signal of uh, platelet aggregometry that uh, was described by Gustav Born but at the same time you can uh, do also something uh, in parallel take uh, whole blood whole blood clots in uh, a tube uh, in a glass tube, so because you generate, uh, in this case, you generate thrombin by activating coagulation. Thrombin, as you know, is a very potent way of activating platelets. And so you give practically, it's like hammering the platelets to produce a huge amount of uh, thromboxin. And you can measure thromboxin B2, which is stable, in the serum. And uh, normal people will have uh, a signal of about 250-300 nanogram per milliliter of uh, thromboxin B2 measured after one hour after whole blood clotting in this uh, test tube. And if you take aspirin, this, uh, this extent of thromboxin production goes down from uh, about 300 to about 5 or 6. So a huge signal-to-noise ratio, which makes this... Uh, the almost ideal test uh, for assessing the effect of aspirin. Interesting, there is um, 
this uh, relationship with the dose that is very easily saturated for doses around 50, 100 milligram. As you see here, upon repeated administration, there is uh, this uh, uh, important, uh, important cumulative effect of aspirin on platelets. And uh, if you give uh, aspirin repeatedly at these very little doses of 100 milligram per day, which is now the standard treatment for uh, protection from cardiovascular diseases, you see that uh, platelet thromboxin goes down incredibly to almost zero. And uh, you can measure the production of uh, endothelial metabolites of prostacycline, for example, the urinary 6-keto PGF1 alpha, uh, is uh, one of these, and this is totally unaffected by these uh, tiny little doses of aspirin because uh, endothelial cells can regenerate cyclooxygenase. Actually, the production of prostacycline is mostly driven in endothelial cells by cyclooxygenase 2. And so you have uh, the opportunity of a selective sparing of endothelial cells and only an effect on platelets that would make this uh, the ideal drug to at least limit thrombotic, the thrombotic process. I say limit because uh, in medicine in general, we never aim at uh, uncompromised efficacy. We don't want uh, to say the patient is cured, but unfortunately he died. We don't want to say this because we always have to strike the balance between efficacy and safety. And probably the reason why aspirin is, has been such a wonder drug is that this little effect, this perfect effect on one single pathway of platelet aggregation, translating into a partial inhibition of platelet function according to the way you measure, is probably the key between efficacy and safety. I say that uh, there is uh, uh, an important difference between uh, a single administration and on repeated administration, and this is shown by the fact that uh, upon repeated administration, you can really achieve the maximum inhibition by giving 100 milligram per day. Now, this is uh, b the biochemical and, let's say, the thrombophysiology uh, story, but uh, there is uh, an important cardiological story that is attached to this, and this is uh, the demonstration that this translates into lives spared by this treatment. And the best example I can give you is uh, the ISIS-2 study that uh, was uh, originated again by British investigator. And uh, this was uh, uh, a testing of uh, two drugs that at that time were available. One was uh, aspirin, and the other was uh, streptokinase, the oldest uh, fibrinolytic drug that we have. Two drugs that act differently on uh, thrombosis. Aspirin working on platelets, streptokinase working on the fibrin clot, dissolves fibrin when fibrin is already formed. And uh, these two drugs may act actually additively. And you see this because uh, Mortality in patients that had a suspicion of a myocardial infarction, not even a clearly demonstrated uh, myocardial infarction, and they were assigned to receive either a chewable compress of uh, tablet of aspirin, 325 at that time, or uh, an injection of streptokinase, an infusion of streptokinase, or both or neither, you see here, 25% re reduction in death with aspirin alone, 25% reduction in death with streptokinase alone, and together a 50% reduction in mortality. This is uh, one of the most impressive results that have ever been obtained by cardiologists. It's by far superior to any little tin tiny benefit that we are trying to achieve at this moment, trying to build up on the knowledge that we have had so far. And this goes back then uh, to the story that uh, Professor Tenkate has shown you, thrombosis as the cause uh, in uh, most cases of uh, um, acute myocardial infarction, unstable angina, what we call now non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, which thrombosis is uh, in most cases non-occlusive. 
and this goes back to the theory of uh, plaque rupture and plaque er erosion as the immediate cause of thrombosis that can be tackled by antithrombotic drugs. But so there was no uncertainty the aspirin works because uh, when this was uh, when the trials of aspirin in secondary prevention were uh, meta analyzed and this is uh, the last uh, meta analysis by the antithrombotic trialist collaboration again by the the Oxford group 16 trials with over 17000 patients and you see the results 20% reduction in major coronary events 31% reduction in non fatal myocardial infarction 13% overall reduction in coronary mortality and also reduction in ischemic stroke, vascular death, serious vascular events. And this uh, happens to be true for male and female. For ischemic stroke, major coronary events, serious vascular events, uh, the way you want to, to measure in secondary prevention, there is no doubt that this is the case. This is uh, again to show the uh, incidence of vascular events in general that are reduced by essentially aspirin. Antiplatelet group means aspirin in this case. And also you have stroke and TIA that uh, is reduced 22%. And this is also very important because this occurs at a very little cost, at a very little harm of the patient. The benefit to risk ratio is extremely favorable in the setting of secondary prevention because you see how large is uh, the benefit, the, the column that you see um, in uh, uh, secondary prevention is clearly that uh, high, but the harm that you see here on the right hand side of the of the uh, slide is much, much lower. So it means that uh, you induce much more benefit than harm. And this concept of the net clinical benefit is what uh, I will now dwell upon. Because you have to understand that uh, cardiovascular risk uh, is uh, uh, not a single entity, is indeed a spectrum. And we can range actually from very uh, acute patients that have a very high risk of recurrences, so such as the patients with an acute coronary syndrome, ACS, patients with an acute myocardial infarction, in whom the risk of having a serious vascular event, death, myocardial infarction and stroke can be computed in the order of 10 major cardiovascular events per 100 patients per year. And at the other end, you have normal people, as you may be, as young children, the risk of having a major cardiovascular event in children and uh, hopefully in uh, all of you in this room is very low, is clearly less than 1% per year. And here we have a spectrum. The spectrum, if you go to the left of ACS, you have the patients in the stable phase after an acute myocardial infarction. Take, for example, a, a patient who had a myocardial infarction one year before. This patient is remote from the acute event. The risk is lower in the order of 4% per year. Then you have, uh, at the end of this, you have the so-called primary prevention before you have any clinical manifestation of disease. But this is a spectrum of situations that goes from entirely normal people, people who will never die of uh, a vascular events, Two people that are seen by the doctor one day or one hour before the myocardial infarction, before any symptom occurs. And you understand that primary prevention is something extremely heterogeneous and this is really the important source of contention at the moment where most of the dispute is going on. And you have to understand that if we have clear indications for, for aspirin in the secondary prevention setting, the problem is now to understand whether we should use it in persons without clinical manifestations of disease. And here are the three words that are used in this case, efficacy, effectiveness, efficiency, that are three different words, because efficacy is what you can measure in terms of saving of events in the setting of a trial. Effectiveness is what you can show in the so-called real world in a registry when you try to translate the results of clinical trials. But then there is this third word that is efficiency that means how to achieve the uh, efficacy at what price. 
And this is exemplified here in this figure in which you see that uh, you have to treat only 22 persons after an acute myocardial infarction to save one major event. But if you go remotely from an acute myocardial infarction in the so-called stable angina situation, you have to treat many more persons in the order of 83. And in primary prevention, you are even more far away and you have to treat many more patients, in this case, in the order of 300 to save one event. So the question is, is it worth or is it not? And I will focus now on this important dispute. I tell you that uh, in uh, 2011, four important meta-analyses appeared and they came to the conclusion that aspirin in primary prevention reduces myocardial infarction in the order of uh, 10 to 6 percent, maybe reduces stroke, it does not reduce apparently vascular mortality and maybe reduces uh, total mortality. There was uh, a strange interesting trend to have uh, total mortality that is reduced more than vascular mortality. We may come back to this later on. So there was a, a kind of uncertain situation there were uh, similar uncertainty in people with peripheral arterial disease. Peripheral arterial disease is uh, very much under the focus of attention at the moment because it's a situation with extensive atherosclerosis in the abdominal aorta, in the lower limbs. So this means that these are subject with an extensive atherosclerotic burden and have uh, a high chance of dying by myocardial infarction over stroke. And there was no clear evidence in the few trials that were available at the time. And so in uh, 2013, there were statements like this. The use of aspirin seems no longer justifiable in primary prevention in patients with or without diabetes, leading to an important paradigm shift from what the Americans used to say. Only five years before, the statement was this. Every male American over 50 years of age should use a baby aspirin every day. So in five years, a complete shift of paradigm from using everybody, and this was actually the time in which aspirin was claimed to be an essential component of the poly pill, with a strategy being given to thousands or millions of people in, uh, in um, the developing world to prevent uh, the epidemics of cardiovascular disease, to now a situation in which uh, some guidelines do not recommend any longer. And uh, statements like this, doctors should select uh, on an individual basis after careful discussion with the patient, or uh, here we are in the house of the European Society of Cardiology, my most criticized uh, statement from uh, the prevention guidelines, 2012, aspirin cannot be recommended in primary prevention due to it, its increased risk of major bleeding. Um, you will understand how unsatisfactory such uh, a statement is because any antithrombotic drug will induce bleeding. So you cannot state that the drug should not be used because it induces bleeding. You should perhaps say because we don't have a clear uh, understanding of the benefit to risk ratio. But anyway, we will come back to this later. So your mother is a 65 years old active lady with hypertension, impaired glucose tolerance, slightly overweight with this plaque, 40%. Would you like to treat her as with aspirin or not? So if you are again looking at this uh, figure, this uh, illustration of the vascular spectrum, you will know that if your mother had already a coronary event, you would have no doubt. But uh, can it be that in primary prevention everybody should not be treated? I think this is uh, clearly something that we have to understand and we have to dissect more. And because of this, we put our effort, we try to squeeze our brain a little bit more and we try to come to assemble a group of people within uh, the working group thrombosis. And uh, we came up with this uh, simple statement that was a reiteration of what uh, Gottfried Leibniz said uh, two ta two 200 years before. Nature doesn't make jumps, natura non facit saltus, which means it is unlikely that all patients should be treated in secondary prevention and no patient should be treated in primary prevention. And the reason to make sense out of this is to do what we call now a meta-regression in which on the abscissa of this graph you put the 
the cardiovascular risk and uh, you plot on the on this graph the percent absolute risk change in terms of efficacy and safety of aspirin the red line depicts the benefit the benefit goes up the absolute benefit goes up with the increase in cardiovascular risk as i showed you you have to treat fewer and fewer patients in order to save one event when the cardiovascular risk goes up but the two the green and, uh, and the pink line and the violet uh, the, uh, line depicts the harm related to aspirin, which is related to also to the cardiovascular risk. Because people who are, for example, older, that are uh, uh, with age, also they have more comorbidities, certainly also they have a higher risk of bleeding. But the concept here is that the separation of the curves becomes wider and wider the more you go towards a higher cardiovascular risk. And because of this, we proposed at that time that uh, we had to make uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, statement based on the risk. And so we said, assess the 10 years cardiovascular risk. If the risk is low and we put this threshold at less than 10%, do not give aspirin. If the risk is intermediate, you are uh, you should act uh, with a sort of uh, yellow traffic light. Perhaps you should go on, but in any case, you should, should evaluate the bleeding risk and uh, the thrombotic risk. And uh, if the, the risk in primary prevention is higher, and we put this figure at 20%, more likely you should go unless you really have a prohibitive increase in bleeding. And we also said at that time, because there was another interesting story that appeared in parallel that aspirin may prevent also some types of cancer, especially colon cancer. This is not related to more diagnosis of cancer. It's really related probably to interference with the carcinogenesis by aspirin. And so we said, consider family history of GI, especially gastrointestinal, especially colon cancer, together with patient values and uh, preferences because if a patient has uh, a history for example of uh, colon polyps perhaps uh, this should be induced to take aspirin in primary prevention easier than uh, a patient without this history. Of course we were uh, very careful in all this statement we were aware of the lack of data in the high risk uh, uh, group we were uh, cautious about this because uh, we also say that lack of evidence uh, is not evidence against uh, and decisions uh, by doctors have to be taken in any case uh, in front of every single patient every day even in the absence of evidence the same logic that guides you not to put your hands on fire because you don't have uh, evidence from randomized control trials and this is very much similar to what uh, the uh, United States Prevention Cardiovascular Disease uh, Task Force uh, assembled by in the, in the United States came to a differentiated position that is, however, very similar to what uh, we stated at that time. But then what happened in 2018? In 2018, in uh, the fall of 2008, we had this, uh, this uh, production of uh, presentation and uh, publication of results from uh, three major trials, the ASCEND trial in uh, people with diabetes, primary prevention in people with diabetes, the ARRIVE trial in uh, people at so-called moderate risk, and then we had the ASPRAY trial in the elderly over 70 years of age. And all these trials, if you look at them superficially, are negative trials negative trials because they are inconclusive for whether you should use aspirin or not. But let's see where, what kind of populations they did examine in the setting of diabetes, in the setting of the so-called moderate risk, or in the setting of the healthy elderly. I plot this uh, on the same graph that I showed you before, and here, we, here you see that the ARRIVE trial uh, actually recruited patients in the low risk in primary prevention, less than 1% per year. The ascend right on the verge between 1% uh, and higher, 
and the Asprey trial slightly above 1%. We wanted to have, desperately, to have trials in the higher risk populations, and you see that there is still no evidence in this population. So we still have to make recommendation in the right-hand part of the figure, and also, I would say, in the middle part of the figure, where the evidence that we have is very mixed and very ambiguous. So ambiguous that if you run the classical meta-analysis, and this is one of the four that has appeared in the meantime, this is by Paul Ridger on the New England Journal of Medicine accompanying the uh, three publications from the ASPRAY trial, you see that there is very little evidence of benefit, perhaps a 3% reduction in total mortality, which is not statistically significant. But still, when you do a meta-regression, and this is our own work, meta-regression by plotting the percent absolute risk change versus the risk of cardiovascular event, you still see that the curves separating the benefit and the risk tend to separate when you go towards higher risk. So this means that there is still a window of opportunity in these cases. Now we have to understand also some other features that happen in the meantime. If this is uh, the conventional scheme of cardiovascular risk, you have to understand that this is not written in stone. And also the secondary prevention risk has changed in the meantime. If you take uh, a contemporary patient with the stable angina, his risk is no longer 4% per year, but probably is in the order of 2% per year. And actually, in the COMPASS trial that Professor Tenkat has just shown, these were uh, people with some rich enrichment criteria for risk, but the average risk of the population, of the control population in COMPASS, was in the order of 2% per year. So you have seen that uh, with better treatment, we are uh, always uh, compressing the risk towards the left. And also you see that in primary prevention, we still have... Uh, people that uh, do not uh, have uh, yet a myocardial infarction or a stroke, but may have it. And their risk is probably in uh, the border zone between primary and secondary prevention, in a kind of gray zone that sometimes is higher than for a patient with a previous myocardial infarction. Some further considerations, and this is close to the end, the current analysis attribute the same weight to irreversible events, and you would agree with me that death is an irreversible event, myocardial infarction and stroke, that these are clear irreversible events, but they are weighted the same way that uh, then a bleeding, even a major bleeding, mostly gastrointestinal bleeding, is not as irreversible as a myocardial infarction or a stroke. If you run a weighted analysis, which is much more complicated, we are embarking on this, you would probably further amplify this uh, benefit to risk ratio. The harm, this is another consideration, mostly gastrointestinal bleeding, is to a large extent preventable with the use of proton pump inhibitors, which are now the default strategy in secondary prevention when you give aspirin, you give a gastroprotection with a proton pump inhibitor, omeprazole, pantoprazole, esomeprazole, and you can decrease sharply the risk of bleeding. And also factor, we said, the probable, I would say probable, effect of aspirin in preventing colon cancer, which is also something not trivial, but cannot appear in trials of three, four years duration, because it requires probably at least eight, ten years to become manifest. And so we are more or less not different from where we were, and this is our updated scheme, less than 10% probably do not give aspirin. First of all, try to control risk factors as, be as best as you can, including statins that are clearly with a more favorable benefit to risk ratio. But if you are in the order of 10 to 20%, <laughs> probably you should go on unless you have a prohibitive uh, history of bleeding without reversible causes. Consider also family history of GI, for example, colon cancer, consider patient values and preferences, and if you are more than 20% in primary prevention, you should probably go on.
And also you can rely upon uh, some other measurement of risk because uh, what you do with uh, risk evaluation with uh, risk charts, for example, the ESC has proposed the score chart, is simply to take risk factors and you try to calculate the risk of the population. But you have now also better way to understand the risk of your patient. For example, you can uh, run uh, an analysis uh, based on surrogate measurement of risk. For example, if you have a carotid ultrasound showing that uh, your mother has a plaque already in the carotid arteries, this means that whatever is uh, the evaluation of your risk chart, it means that your mother already had important atherosclerosis in the carotids. And so you can skip completely the evaluation of risk factors because you have already evidence of atherosclerosis. And you can do it now also with the ankle brachial index, measuring the uh, impact of asymptomatic peripheral arterial disease. Or you can do it with the calcium score, with uh, a simple CT scan with low dose radiation, no injection of uh, contrast media, so no risk for the patient other than more or less the equivalent of uh, 10 x-rays uh, given to the patient. So you can have an estimate of uh, the calcium that is deposited in the coronary arteries and uh, whatever calcium may mean in general it goes in parallel with the atherosclerotic burden. And so in this clinical scenario, your mother, 65 years old, active with a routine carotid ultrasound showing a plaque, would you like her to be treated with aspirin or not? Yes, I would treat her. And my final considerations are that the doctor is not a prophet, is not a magician in any case. We can only do statistical predictions. Yet the accuracy of those predictions is what distinguishes the good doctor who sometimes still makes mistakes from the bad doctor who makes mistakes more often. So this is the distinction between the better versus the worse equilibrist. Not different from the scientist, I would say this is really related to you. The scientist, you bet on one topic rather than on another to inspire your own research for the next 10 years. You have to walk on this tightrope. The better you are, the better you study the literature, the most likely you are not to make mistakes. Thank you very much.